Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. There's a whole lot of police over here for just a simple open group meeting, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is. It's, it's flattering. It's flattering to have so much, you know, it's a secure feeling. Yeah. So before I begin, I, I have a little disclaimer, which is nowadays uh, important in our area, in, in the era of, uh, of data. You know, uh, I, I cannot emphasize enough, uh, artificial intelligence depends on data. The availability of good data, of clean data, of reliable data, of non-fake data, I guess, is an incredibly important thing. And, and so, so um, if, if we are to build solutions, I notice that most of the AI solutions that we're currently looking at, at least many of them, are, are let's say, consumer-oriented. So we see a lot of personal data of individuals, including all of their preferences, and, and we see gold in this, as an industry in, in terms of uh, being able to individualize, for example, and to be very predictable in terms of consumer preferences. And, and having said that, we all feel that there's a very thin line between, between being extremely intimate towards uh, people and being predictive and being uh, seamless about, about feeling, uh, about what, they, what, what they're looking for and, and what they're moving towards, versus uh, being downward creepy. Mm -hmm. And downward <laughs> creepy. And, and uh, there's, there's, as you may know, in, in the US there's even a creepy line. So you can call that line if you feel your, your personal data is sort of invaded. I, I guess there have been a few calls in the past few weeks to that creepy line, probably. <laughs> Um, so, so we need to be very much aware of this, and I just want to use this disclaimer. I'm not here today, this morning, to discuss all the ethical aspects of it, although we might imagine that this afternoon, during the Open Platform free those session, we might be diving a little bit more into that as well, right? Uh, but, but for now, I'm, I'm just moving a little bit towards this idea of what a reference architecture might look like. Uh, and particularly the journey towards a reference architecture, I think, is interesting. So, but let's not forget this, this whole ethical thing, the fine balance. Between, between being very predictive and almost psychic about what the world or a person or individual needs versus being downright creepy is, is I think, a, a very fine balance here that we all need to navigate. And hopefully architecture can help us a, a, a little bit to, to achieve just that. Um, the, the funniest thing ever is, uh, is that currently IT people, every now and then, they tend to take themselves way too serious. Um, just, just, I can still remember, it must be already 10 years ago now, one of my esteemed colleagues at that time, uh, who was a well-known enterprise architect, took himself so serious that he believed that we needed an oath of uh, Hippocrates for enterprise architects. Because enterprise architects, you know, they were, you know, in full possession of immense powers to change the world. And, and the industries and, and companies, enterprise architects, were clearly even more important than doctors deciding about life and death, right? So, so he felt a, a real enterprise architect should swear an oath uh, about, about the proper use of enterprise architecture as well. Well, I'm glad to say that they really work out, because I think, uh, of course, enterprise architecture is important. Let's not exaggerate uh, about it, right? And, and the same is going to happen with AI. And again, it's an ethical discussion, because maybe some people are right to say we need to have an oath of Hippocrates around AI as well, because artificial intelligence could change the world potentially. So, so anybody involved in artificial intelligence maybe should sort of spare an oath as well. I don't know what oaths mean nowadays anyway in this world, and, and uh, you know, uh, what it means to be ethical is also not too clear uh, anymore, just watch the news. Uh, but, but anyway, um, just as a disclaimer, these are the, the things that we need to be aware of as well. But, but my real uh, topic today, um, by the way, John, not, not a timer running, John. There's not a timer running, so I'm not sure where I am in terms of time, but uh, anyway. Um, I'll, I'll take two hours then, probably. Um, so, so um, th there, there's no topic more uh, popular right now, it seems, in the boardroom than artificial intelligence. Many of you are probably IT people, well, at least a lot of you look like IT people, and, and uh, some of you probably are not, are in the business side. But if there's one item which is popular in the boardroom right now with business people, it's AI. So, so uh, obviously there, there, there's a lot of reasons for it, and, and a lot of non-reasons probably as well, because this industry thrives a little bit on, on the hype we create ourselves. But I think there's very good reasons uh, to be extremely enthusiastic about AI, also at the business side. Many of the big AI engagements I've seen in the past year, or let's say a year and a half, I would say most of them, the bulk of them, were driven by business people. And often there were even very few IT people uh, involved in the strategy sessions uh, that were set up around artificial intelligence. So, so if we understand that, 
enthusiasm and let's say the, 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 the transformative potential of AI, uh, sooner or later we start to look at architecture. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, I've always believed that architecture, particularly enterprise architecture, uh, that there's only one reason in life not to be uh, certified on it, by the way, or swear an oath about it, but to actually enable change. I think the only role of architecture in the end is to be a foundation for change, to enable change. It's not the meaning of life, it's, it's a tool to enable change. And if we understand that AI, if we, if we appreciate that AI will change business, uh, the enterprise, we, we realize that architecture will be a crucial tool to achieve that. Now we all know that it's very tempting to dive right into, okay, so what, what deep learning framework do I need then, right? And what cognitive API tool set should I adopt? And, and okay, how should I manage my data so that it's a bit secure and predictable? So, so there's a lot of interest around the actual tooling around this, but I believe as proper enterprise architects, we should build it up. So, so I'll take you through a little journey that we've been through so far in terms of understanding actually what it means. So it means to, to, to work towards a reference architecture. So that's that's really what I uh, intend to do in my uh, little speech, which which I'm not sure about timing, but uh, let's see, what time did I start? Okay, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll sort of try to guess where I am. Oh, you're working on this. Oh yeah, technology, yeah? The new yeah. MacBooks and stuff, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, there's, no, no, it's not. It's, uh, it's a very nice slide, but it's my slide. <laughs> Uh, never mind. Um, so, um, before, of course, we dive into uh, AI and, and what it does to enterprises, we need, of course, to understand what it is. Now, if there's one thing that, that we can really spend our life on, or even, you know, bombard it to the meaning of life, it's discussing what AI is and what it means. Uh, so, I decided to certainly not pass on that opportunity to add my own definition as well. So, so here, here would be my definition of what it is. I think uh, often the definition of AI is it's human intelligence, but artificial. And I think uh, it, it doesn't do justice to the actual potential of AI, because I think it goes way beyond that. I think uh, artificial intelligence is not only mimicking uh, human intelligence, as we know it, but also other forms of intelligence that we as humans still would perceive as intelligence, but might go way beyond uh, what we've seen ourselves as, as humans so far. So, so I like that idea. It's, a, it's our perception of humans of something that is intelligent. Uh, it's a perception, right? And, and then, of course, if you're talking about perceptions, um, I found until now that the most effective way to explain AI is by examples. So rather than to, to really get nitty-gritty about the details of the definition, I'm sure, by the way, that this esteemed community would be pretty good at that discussion these different definitions, right, until the end of times, but um, what's probably more interesting at this point is simply to discuss, uh, you know, just mention a few examples, as you can see them over here as well. And we, and we all realize, we already saw some examples this morning, the whole, the whole ability in, in terms of natural language understanding and processing and generation is, is a clear example. Image recognition, uh, autonomous systems, audio, video, um, indexing, um, but also, I would say, very complex algorithms and predictive algorithms uh, with a, with a uh, level of accuracy uh, as we've never seen before. I would, all, all of these, I would, you know, sort of, sort of see as, as intelligence perceived by humans. And even, uh, at least within our company, there's a discussion, uh, pretty straightforward, rule-based stuff, like robotic process automation, I'm sure most of you are aware, RPA. Um, is, 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 is by many of our clients at, le at least perceived as intelligence and, and hence they consider it part of the whole AI portfolio as well and who are we to, dis you know, who are we to discuss that or to, or to doubt that uh, if we feel as humans that that is a, a level of intelligence as well look it's doing automatic things with SAP screens like humans used to do before now the system does it magically on itself if we perceive that there's intelligence fine it's, it's just a, a set of, of rule based scripts uh, usually, but, but if that's the case, uh, we, we would perceive that as uh, probably as, uh, as AI as well. So, so that's that's really um, what I would like to uh, begin with. Yeah, why not power it on? Yeah, that, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> no, still not. Uh, no, no. So, so um, I don't want to go too technical, as I said, uh, because because there's many different technologies, and actually, as a matter of fact, some of the natural language uh, technologies, uh, the natural language solutions that have been discussed earlier. I would say that they might not necessarily be based on, uh, on, on deep um, uh, neural networks or deep learning, if you like, on neural networks. Uh, but on the other hand, it's fair to say that the increased enthusiasm in the past two, three years, uh, to a large extent, 
except maybe the natural language area, are due to, uh, to uh, deep learning or, or deep uh, neural networks. And this is a very simple technology, actually. <coughs> just talking to uh, another person in this uh, thing, many of the veterans in, uh, in IT will tell you, hey, I did this in the 80s uh, and in the 90s, and this is all true. Some people will even claim, hey, I did this in the 50s, but that's... Uh, the, the thing is, uh, many of these technologies have been very well known to us for quite a few years, but the breakthroughs we're currently seeing, both in our ability to collect and store data in, in amounts and, and structures and unstructured that we've never seen before, absolutely not able to do that in the 80s or the 90s, and also, of course, uh, the uh, highly optimized processor architectures like GPU style, FPGA plus type of, of processor architectures that are particularly suitable for, for neural networks, all, all have brought a breakthrough in terms of, for example, autonomous driving cars and, and the uh, ability to really understand um, speech uh, to, you know, with an accuracy that we haven't seen only just a few years before, right? So there's a breakthrough over there, partially thanks to big data, another part of the illustrious open 3.0, open platform 3.0. Um, the digital enablers is of course big data. Big data brought us the capability to store huge amounts of data, uh, structured or non-structured, make it available very quickly. I think that's that's an important thing that that, that drove the current uh, popularity of, of AI. Combined it indeed with optimized uh, uh, process architectures, massive massive parallel, but, but particularly geared towards you know building processes. Like, like your, your iPhone uh, 10, for example, some of you no doubt have the iPhone 10. It has a complete neural network on board, right, that recognizes your face. And it's just on the chip itself, and, and it's there. And, and that's the reason why it's so fast right now. Things we absolutely couldn't uh, achieve in the 80s or in the 90s. A neural network is, uh, I'm not sure some of you probably have heard of it, probably many haven't. It's the dumbest thing ever. A neural network. <laughs> no, really, it's the dumbest thing ever. It has nothing to do with data science as we typically know it. So there are no algorithms, there are no statistics, there's no math, there's nothing. It's just a very silly dumb machine that matches input with output. It has potentially thousands, ten thousands, even if necessary, hundred thousands of tiny little buttons, nodes, that are all connected. And it just tries to, for any real input record, try to adjust itself in the dumbest way ever to match the output that you get. And, and it sort of gets better and better. It doesn't know what it's doing. It's just, you know, pushing all little buttons and turning it a little bit to, to further adjust itself to ensure that you have a proper match between input and output. That's all it is. It is, dumb. It is as dumb as you can possibly imagine. It's, it's too dumb even, you know, to, to explain. Uh, but the thing is, it works. And, 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 and if you don't get what a neural network is, think about us as children. We all learned how to catch a ball. Right? We, we all learned how to catch a ball. We can't remember because we were too young, probably, <coughs> of us, right? But we all learned how to catch a ball, and the way we did it, we didn't have a clue. So they throw a ball at us, and we don't know what to do with the thing, right? So, you know, we fail. All of us fail because we have no clue how to catch a ball. And then they throw another ball, and it happens again and again, and it's frustrating. Somehow you get better. You adopt it yourself. And sooner or later, you have to think. And if you would ask us, oh, little children, how did you do that? I, I don't know. I just adjusted myself, I, I, you know, all these knots over there, I sort of changed it a little bit so that I could catch the ball. But if you later on would ask, how did you do that? You're like, I don't know. You know, I just adapt to it. And that, that is the fascinating, but also the scary thing about the deep neural networks. They are completely opaque. They are black boxes. They just adjust themselves by all these little tiny buttons. And we know how the tiny little buttons that they actually work, but on, on what basis it exactly matches input to output in the end, based maybe on hundreds of thousands of records, input records and, and output, we don't know, right? So it's opaque. It's like asking the centipede with a thousand feet how it walks. You know, the, the moment you ask the centipede, it's like, uh, you know, it freezes, it's petrified, it doesn't know how it walks. And this is the same with the deep neural network. That, that's all really I want to say about it, but I, I think it's crucial. Uh, to, to understand that this is one of the breakthroughs that we've seen. So, so if we're looking currently at, at some technology options for artificial intelligence, although I would say that, that a lot of it is ranked among it, right? So it could be robotic process automation, it could be the typical language type of facilities that are not necessarily all based on, on neural networks. Uh, original IBM Watson was also not based, you know, the whole Jeopardy, the Jeopardy thing was not necessarily based on neural networks. So language is another aspect of it. Much of the advanced algorithms, advanced analytics as we know it, still feature very fancy data science as we know it, and it's still part of 
the AI wave as well, but I think it's fair to say that particularly the neural networks are, are crucial in this. So, so we understand a little bit what it is, and, and why we see some breakthroughs currently happening. Now let's move a little bit further in, into our uh, architectural journey. Because in the end, if we create an architecture, we first of all appreciate that, that AI in this case, where we want to design architectural foundations for, actually has the, uh, the, the change potential, right? Actually has the enabling qualities for an organization to, uh, to transform. So, so you, you could say, if we create something and, and we create an architecture, we want to ensure that any project we want to unleash on top of that architecture actually will enable us to, to elevate our corporate IQ a little bit. Steve just mentioned uh, Technovision over here. Thank you very, very much, by the way, for plugging that. I did that as well, but uh, still, all go there, please. Uh, Capgemini.com slash Technovision, but it's, it's our yearly trend series. And one of the big, let's say, design principles, uh, as, as architects, you would appreciate design principles. One of the design principles we've put over there is the notion of IQ up. Whatever project you put in your portfolio, whatever initiative you would launch, it would sort of add to the corporate IQ. It would add something to your profit and loss balance of corporate IQ. And, and we all realize that in the era of artificial intelligence, the more we can raise our intelligence, artificial or not, as a corporation, the better it is. So, so we need to define an architecture and a change approach that actually leverages and, and, and you know, um, grows that, that corporate IQ, um, if you like. So, so um, the first thing to, to look at, that, and this is another uh, design principle we've used in uh, Technovision for quite a few years now, is uh, to look at companies that already successfully done so. What company, I would say, that, that, that does that successfully, um, you know, is bigger in this than, than Amazon, probably. I, I'm sure that to some of you it might all, already be almost a cliche, but, but rest assured, this, this company uh, is, is not only, uh, I think, one of the most innovative companies in the world, they truly are. They have an innovation strategy and an innovation culture uh, and a process which is a second to none. It's absolutely impressive the way they do it. For example, Werner Vogels, the uh, CTO of uh, Amazon Web Services, once told me that, that the only um, way you can stop an innovation proposal by anybody is to prove that it won't work. So this is fairly different, right? Usually if we want to launch an innovation project, we, uh, we have to move heaven and earth in order to get it done, right? And to convince people. Here what you need to do is to have somebody <coughs> to convince you that it won't work. You know, just, just as an idea. Not so long ago, a year, a month and a half ago, I was over here in London, the MRS conference, which is one of the biggest marketing research conferences uh, in the world. And then they did some research themselves, interestingly enough, uh, to see what's the most trustworthy brand. And it also turned out to be Amazon right now. Probably not Facebook at this point. <laughs> most trustworthy brand in the world, for some reason, right? They have, you know, slight, slightly image, some slight image problems probably. But Amazon is also ranked among the, the most trusted, it's actually the most trusted company in the world. I also would say, if we want to understand what an AI first company is, I think they're pretty, doing pretty well themselves as well. And, and I believe as an architect, we always, first of all, need to ask the question, you know, what type of enterprise do we want to enable with our architecture? Because we don't know that. No, we just want to do fancy things with AI and the neural networks. That's, that's not interesting. What we do want to understand is what does a company look like? that actually uses AI in everything that it's doing. And look at Amazon. Everybody knows, of course, that they started as an online bookstore, right? And you have their famous recommendations. Their recommendations got better and better. Nowadays, no longer based on, on let's say, statistics like, like, you know, adaptive filtering. But instead, nowadays, it's based on, on, on neural networks that, that are simply, literally like that black box in terms of there's so much preferences over here, there's so much next choices over here. You know, we're trying to match that, we don't even exactly know what we're doing. But they're so good nowadays at recommendations that they are at the level of the so-called psychic pizza, right? They can deliver psychic pizzas. You don't know? There's no? Like, so psychic pizza, you know, imagine it's Friday, Friday evening, 7 p.m. You start to get hungry, suddenly realize, start to get hungry, doorbell rings. Pizza delivery. <laughs> They just knew. They, they knew. They knew you wanted the pizza before you knew it. But they're so psychic. They're so aware of, of, of your preferences and, and, and how, how that will evolve over time that they can deliver the psychic pizza. The, the pizza knows it, it, you want it before you know it yourself, right? Same reason that they've already been uh, contemplating uh, for Amazon Prime members, certain selected members, to deliver an Amazon box every two weeks. It's a box and you open it and you're like, oh, that's... 
the, exactly what I wanted. I didn't know. But <laughs> I didn't know. But now I, I, I didn't even know myself I wanted them. But this is so spot on. Right? And they're actually working on this stuff. Right? Believe me. Better believe it. Huh? Is, is there a fine balance between very, being very intimate and downright creepy? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. But hey, they, they can do this. Huh? This is what they do with AI. Obviously, everybody knows Amazon's Alexa. I'm quite sure many of you have it, or it's Google Home, or whatever. But the thing is, there, there's, there's deep learning underneath here, right, in order to recognize your voice. There's also, by the way, language processing, but it's certainly also speech recognition, which is very much driven, obviously, by AI. Then we have their unmanned warehouses, clearly. Uh, there are 43,000 different uh, automated uh, robots uh, driving around over there in these warehouses. They're virtually unmanned, these warehouses. There's a lot of AI behind these things. There are, of course, there are the delivery drones that are still working on, very much depend on AI in order to uh, not create an accident and actually get where they should be, despite all sorts of unpredictable events that might occur during the flight. And, and by the way, you do realize what's the, one of the very first things they really start to deliver with these drones is, of course, pizza, uh, because that's one of the favorite topics for a delivery drone is pizza, so that's funny. So, psychic pizza delivered through a drone. This sort of AI first, I guess, uh, by them. Uh, and then, of course, I, I was in Seattle myself uh, just last week. Um, Amazon Go Store is, is of course, uh, the sort of the pinnacle of, of what you can achieve with AI. I'm sure all of you know it by now, Amazon Go. It's, uh, it's a checkout-less uh, store, right? You just walk in with your Amazon ID, and it automatically starts to follow you with, with, with the tons and tons of cameras and other uh, te uh, sensor technology. They know exactly what you're picking up from the shelves. Also, if you're very sneaky, try to pick two. You know, do like it's one, you know, you try to do it like that, or, or you, you pretend that you're putting it back and so on, doesn't work. So it's, it's completely uh, aware. Again, intimate versus creepy, eh? you, you get the point. Eh? A lot of people love it anyway, because you just get into the store, and uh, you walk out with the stuff, and there's nothing, there's no checkouts, there is no gates to go through or whatever. It, it just follows you and knows what you've taken with you. And, and, and trust me, you have the invoice before you actually left the store. And uh, they already invoice you because they're pretty good at that as well. Um, so, so if you are in Seattle, it's, it's next to the Amazon Sphere, which is their, their little uh, indoor jungle that they created to work in, talking about work-life balance. They have sort of thousands of different plants from across the world, like a little indoor zoo, and you're supposed to work there. Any Amazon employee can work there as well. So yeah, sort of an inspiring company at this point, I guess. You never know what it looks like today or tomorrow, but for now, I'd say they're a very nice example. And then, of course, they, they have developed all of that fancy AI technology stuff. And they actually realized they're a retailer. Hey, why don't we sell it? So, so the, funny, the most funny thing, which I always consider a, a real landmark of a of company that dares to reinvent it themselves, they're like, hey, we develop all of these tech technology for our purposes, the purposes you see over here, and many other examples, by the way. But why not sell that technology itself as well to anybody else who wants it? Even other retailers. Trust me, there's a lot of retailers that currently say we would use any cloud except, of course, for AWS. Because retailers, you know, they're, they're, they're a competition. But trust me, there's a lot of retailers that won't admit it, but are actually using the cloud uh, as well, uh, the, the Amazon cloud for their purposes, simply because it's very cost effective and, and uh, the highest quality, right, that you could possibly imagine. So, so that's, so that's I, I think that's the, the landmark of a retailer. Uh, uh, of an AI-first company that, that actually sells all the technologies that develop uh, themselves as well to do whatever wants to have it. Just as an example of what does an AI-first company look like? There's even an AI-first country, by the way. Did you know? I'll well, think about uh, who might be it. So it's certainly not the US. I can tell you. It's also not the UK. No, it's not even Commonwealth, I believe. Oh, not, yeah, no, that, that wouldn't be Commonwealth. Anyway. I'll, I'll be back a little bit uh, on, on even AI-first countries. Because what these AI-first countries do is also a very interesting example to us as architects uh, what it would mean to, to actually enable that and what you need to set up uh, in, in order to, to achieve that. Nice thing about Amazon is also that they uh, you know, introduced uh, quite some time back the notion of uh, the Mechanical Turk. You may have heard of it, it's already more than 10 years old. At that time, uh, we have already had this idea of if we could launch a web service, that would trigger some artificial intelligence. Uh, that, that would be nice, right? And, and the only thing was that behind that web service, often, we still need a human intelligence to perform that intelligence task. 
Mechanical Turk is, uh, mentioned, is, is mentioned after the famous uh, chess computer in the 18th century, developed by a Hungarian scientist. It was a, uh, you know, it had a doll, it was a marionette. Uh, it had a turban, so, so they called it the Turk, what did they know? It had a turban, so hey, it's a Turk, probably. And so they called it the Mechanical Turk, it was a chess computer. And it beat all the grandmasters and also the royalties and anybody else who wanted to play that machine, the machine beat it. But actually, inside there was a human, a tiny little chess player, grandmaster, that had an ingenious set of mirrors, so, so you could see what's happening on the board. And it, 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 I think it lasted something like 70 years before somebody actually found out uh, how they did it. So, so this was a, a big thing. It's, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is quite old, as you can see. So this is the end of the 18th century, Mechanical Turk. And, and Amazon realized, well, you know, uh, we, we would have a whole web service interface for any human intelligence task. And, and then you launch it as a web service through an API, as we all know it, but behind it are still humans. It's a crowdsourced community that very quickly picks up a human intelligence task, you know, subscribe to interesting tasks that they want to do and then carry it out. And, and the nice thing is, if you nowadays look, they're, they're still active, but if you look at the type of tasks that were typically done through the Amazon Mechanical Turk system, you start to realize that there are different variants of intelligence, and that helps us also to put together an architecture. There is, a, I would say, a level of intelligence that would be uh, taking the robot out of the human. So this is simply to automate things that we all realize that humans do themselves as well in a very automatic, repeatable, uh, predictable way. So, so you could, for example, say, well, go to the third line of any website, you know, you, you, you copy and paste uh, uh, the, the first seven words, put it in a database, and, you know, make it available. Uh, a lot of things that knowledge workers nowadays do themselves as well behind the screens, right? And, and it's just that, that 10 years ago, uh, it's still something that was worth to dispatch to humans that would do it behind a, a web service and then often in seconds you would have the result, right? And it's being done for you, or maybe it's done a few thousand times by all sorts of different crowdsourced, uh, you know, members of, of this particular community. So that's one level, taking a robot out of the human. I would say the second is more interesting, and often we nowadays don't consider that to be the highlight of what we can achieve with AI. This is about cognitive capabilities. And cognitive capabilities are human-like capabilities in terms of communication and reasoning, and, and you know, making others understand and solve an issue. Human capabilities, if you like. And, and we see a lot of these things on Amazon as well. Why don't you write a little summary about a political essay? Or why don't you describe in a few lines a scenario? And, uh, you know, or, or why don't you um, sort out the purple unicorns on these pictures? You know, select the ones that feature a purple unicorn. These are, are human capabilities, cognitive capabilities, if you like, that, that uh, at that time, 10 years ago, systems were usually not able to do at all. See all of the, the, the text analysis, for example, that we saw this morning. That, that's pretty advanced stuff, not able to do it 10 years ago. So it was a human intelligence task driven by a web service. And I would say that this is often the area where we're typically talking about nowadays. To augment ourselves with cognitive capabilities that we recognize, sort of. We understand how to find a purple unicorn in the picture, or how to write a summary. Some of us might be better at it than others. We get, we get the point. We know how to stop. So, so we augment ourselves, if you like, with these cognitive capabilities. It's another area that, that we need to deal with from an architectural perspective. And then the third area, I would say, is really it goes beyond what we're able to do as, uh, as humans ourselves. Everybody knows, I think, the famous AlphaGo uh, story, of course, uh, Go, the, the Asian board game that was considered the final frontier. Uh, computers couldn't beat um, human players at Go because it was a poetic, metaphysical, uh, you know, spiritual game, if you like. Um, but, but then deep learning came, and, and which was a very simple approach. Hey, look, there, there's white and black moves. Hey, black is one. Nothing else, no, no rules, nothing, no algorithms, nothing, just they look white, white moves, black moves. Oh no, white is one. And you, you feed it in a few thousand games, it starts to get better, right? Because it's, through deep learning it sort of tries to catch the ball, right? It gets better and better. And then you do something very uh, smart, which is called reinforcement learning. You, you have to, various instances of this system play against itself. Not a few thousand times like you were able to capture the board games as they were, but a few million times. It plays brute force against itself, and it gets better and better and better, and then it beats the world champion in sound. And nowadays, everybody realizes it's you know it can, cannot be beaten anymore. And by the way, Google that brought this system said it's no fun anymore. 
to say it wasn't at that time a jeopardy, you know, that there's no challenge anymore, so we'll do something else, something interesting, maybe in the medical space. And it's the same with this Alpha Go team that said, well, maybe we should use Google's DeepMind for, for something more useful than reading somebody at all, but we wanted to make a point, right? And now it's no fun anymore. So the MCP is at least a doll who was the world, world champion beaten by this system said, uh, okay, I can no longer beat the system because it's obviously superior right now, but it made a few moves that I considered. <coughs> out of this world. They were exotic, alien moves that a human never would have considered to make, but they were valid. And he said, I learned as a Go player from it, made me, as a human Go player, you know, much more diverse as well. I actually learned from the system, although I never understood why it would make such a move, uh, which I think is interesting. Same reason, by the way, that Miss Pac-Man, the optimal score in Miss Pac-Man could never be achieved. This is not Pac-Man, this is Mrs. Pac-Man, it's a female version, much more complex. <laughs> so, no, it's true. Mrs. Pac-Man is much more complex than Pac-Man. No, really. And, and, and the optimal score could never be achieved, of course. Uh, and, and then, and again, with, with similar technology that I just mentioned to you, Microsoft actually created a set of um, uh, AI solutions that actually created the optimal score here. But I want to say is sometimes we see solutions that go way beyond what we as humans uh, could possibly imagine and think of. So, so one of the things that we need to realize from an architectural perspective is what type of impact do we want to achieve with AI? Is it automatic, so taking the robot out of the human? Is it a cognitive addition? Or are we actually thinking about fully reimagining uh, solutions and, uh, and systems as well? Um, we did find, by the way, that another way of looking at this uh, in terms of shaping a portfolio uh, based on an architecture is uh, to, to look at uh, the, the benefits that you achieve versus the complexity. Very simple thing, but when we did our research last year in terms of where are companies actually currently uh, focusing their efforts on in terms of AI solutions, we found that there's a lot of people on the upper right hand corner. A lot of companies are in the upper right hand corner with their current AI solutions, which means that they are looking, yes, for the high benefits potentially, but they're also looking for trouble. So, so they're looking for the more complex projects that might take several years and, and are difficult to achieve. Uh, on the short term and, and achieve tangible benefits on the short term. So, so our uh, recommendation currently often is when you start to shape your portfolio on, on, on top of your vision of an AI first company, you may as well want to focus on a few areas that are uh, high benefits and low achievements. You know, easy to do, not, not, not difficult to achieve, and, and, but have a high benefit. And uh, by the way, you can download that report if you have a sudden download urge this evening. You don't want to go to the party or whatever, you may as well want to download it. Uh, it's all uh, available. It features hundreds of different use cases. And what I found with AI, the, the, the thing that we need to do as architects more than anything else is simply lead by example and show as many examples as we can of AI, also as an inspiration for imagine that we would be the, the Amazon of telco or the Amazon of healthcare, you know, or the Amazon of, of insurance. And, and, and then you start to you know, sort of lead by example, and I think us as architects need to do that as well. Um, if you look at architectures, I think we need to understand, again, given what we are looking for, that there are different levels of, uh, of um, let's say, complexity, and, and how deep you want to be in the infrastructure. That's the infrastructure level itself, where we're really talking about the GPU and, and parallel processing architectures. We're talking chip level, and, and, and virtual images, and, and uh, systems that actually run it for us. On top of that, you see, particularly in AI, I would say the deep learning networks, and again, there is more than that, but the deep learning neural networks, and you see a lot of particularly open source frameworks. At two levels, by the way, there's the, there's the deep level, Linux style almost, you know, open source, bare metal style of, of um, neural networks, and then you have more friendly, uh, high, high productivity uh, frameworks on top of that. So, for example, Gluon and, and Keras are, are uh, more friendly ways of, of creating neural networks, modeling them and training them rather than, than the, the bare metal stuff which is underneath, right? So, so that's a decision that needs to be made. I would predict that many more of us will be architecting for the use of APIs on top of that. So imagine I need image recognition, I need voice recognition, I need natural language generation, I need natural language understanding, I need conversational uh, technologies. I'll use APIs, it's a web service. Almost like, like the Amazon artificial, artificial intelligence I just showed to you. And we don't need to understand that there is somebody catch, trying to catch the ball underneath there. That there is a deep learning neural network underneath. No, just supply it with the data, train it, get it better, and, and apply it through an API and use it. Hey, it recognizes things. 
right? So, so I think many of us will actually be more interested in that level at the end. And, and then on top of that, you, you, will explain, you will expect complete solutions that already contain predefined models, or you just need to link it up with your own training data, and you get, a, let's say, a predefined solution that has AI in it. And it would be able, for example, in the case of Raven, to go through a, a contract that has been created 20 years ago, and it will be able to tell you what obligations you have according to that contract. And you just feed it with the contracts, and that's it. it find the obligations, even can automatically put it in an obligation management system. Or what's in health, for example, which is a set of solutions that use AI to, to you know, to facilitate us in, in doing all sorts of things in healthcare. And we don't, we don't care anymore. There's even several levels underneath what, what type of AI technology is actually being used over there. Having said that, for anybody with a sort of a, uh, you know, background in software engineering, obviously it's uh, good for the sports just to have a good exposure to the actual neural networks and actually having created one yourself and populated and trained and used it is sort of, I, I would say, exciting, but that's probably me. It's, uh, it's a bad habit <coughs> because you don't really need it. Uh, it helps, of course, as architects that we understand what is underneath over there. So, so um, um, I, I really don't want to dive into what it actually then in the end looks like because you can see the same areas I just mentioned to you, uh, you see pop up in more uh, details. Uh, logical architectures, if you like, uh, as well. Um, uh, we've gone through the conceptual part, we're looking a little bit over here, what type of services you actually will need. They go from infrastructure all the way up to solutions and the API level. And obviously, as I began my presentation, we need to manage the data very carefully. So there's a whole series of stuff around it that we need to put together as well in order to feed the system with the right data and ensure that it actually learns from the proper materials. Uh, but also that the way that we deploy it, of course, is, is being used in the, in the proper way. It's quite a crucial one. We'll see a lot of Ash uh, AI uh, pop up in the forthcoming uh, years, which means that we have a, pre we have a model, we, we design it, we train it, uh, we test it, it's all right, and then we can download it. For example, even the smallest sensor system, you still would have on the chip the possibility to run and actually train a model somewhere over there. So there will be some very interesting work to be done in the IoT space as well, um, in terms of AI reference architectures. Um, and then of course you, you will instantiate it with the actual tooling. Uh, I did this one for Amazon, we have one for Microsoft, we have one for passive breed open source tools. You can imagine several others, you, you can do it for the IBM uh, ecosystem as well. And, and you simply pick up all the various layers. Uh, sorry about it, it's, it's not an argument, but uh, this is actually the design language that Amazon are using. So they created, if you, if you happen to know, a complete library of uh, icons that they use to create their architectural diagrams. Microsoft has a similar one, by the way. And, and you see all the actual products, and you instantiate it with the actual products and, and the way they work together. Which I think at this stage is not the main message I wanted to bring across. I'm sure in Platform 3.0 will have a lot of interesting work to do in the forthcoming years, to work on all these different levels. But as architects, particularly as enterprise architects, it's for us absolutely crucial to understand what the transformative impact is we want to enable with our enterprise architecture. And, and I felt I needed to emphasize that and show you a little bit of the journey that we've been coming through in the, in the past few um, um, months and even years uh, to, to, uh, to, to approach um, reference architectures like, uh, like this. So my time is over. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so so the, the country that, uh, that already has declared itself AI first is uh, United Arab Emirates. Not so strange that Dubai, of course, is uh, hosting the World Expo in 2020, which is very nearby now. And rest assured, I happen to know, they are quite ambitious in making uh, you know, a good name for themselves for, around them. So, so uh, United Arab Emirates uh, has declared itself, um, and it's funny, by the way, city Dubai, AI, Dubai, so that's sort of uh, happy coincidence, I guess. But they've declared themselves an AI first country. And I think as architects, it's actually very inspiring to look at what they've done. Because they created all the use cases on the left, so they particularly focused on the use cases, lead by example, don't make the difficult diagrams, you know, just, just tell what you want to enable, and then we'll create your architecture to enable it. And, and they also uh, educated their own executives, which is, I think, a hilarious, so they have a minister of AI, but they also educated all their other VPs. In, a, in the government to actually be very much aware of this, created a, a whole a training program for them as well. 
uh, and actually, uh, literally, it's a design principle for them. Whatever solution, whatever budget proposal we see uh, within uh, the government, uh, we'll have, we actually ask ourselves the question, is this an AI first proposal? And have we actually thought about the impact of AI in whatever we want to do as a government, as a country? Which I think is uh, quite an interesting, uh, have a look at it, you'll find much more about it. Uh, because, you know, United Arab Emirates, they like to sort of communicate and show to the world what they're doing over there, they're pretty much proud of it, and I guess there's a good reason for it as well. So, thank you very much uh, for uh, bearing with me uh, so early in the morning. I hope you agree with me, it's a, it's a very exciting uh, uh, time to come. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's not only about reference architecture, I hope you appreciate, but also about the journey of understanding what actually should be in that architecture that I uh, tried to, uh, to share with you uh, this morning. Thank you very much for listening. Stop all engines, right? Stop the projects. There's, there's something very dangerous going on over here. 
So, so, so I, I, I do really, I, I think on one hand, of course, this, this, this asks for very established good practices in terms of data privacy and security. I think the whole GDPR thing over here, for example, in Europe, will help us a lot. I don't you see that as a showstopper, I see it as an enabler uh, to, to ensure the proper use of pri pri private data, particularly personal data, but also very sensitive or, let's say, potentially life threatening. Uh, data. I think these are very sound practices, and the interesting thing is, if, if we want to really enter the, the, the digital era, we need to realize it's a foundation, not the meaning of life, to most of us. So I always like to ask security people, not why do you stop it, but uh, how do you enable what we want to do? That's the right question to security experts, not should we do this? No, how can you enable me to do this? I think is uh, the, the proper way of looking at it. Well, we're going to leave it, leave it there. But we yeah, sorry about that. We do have a, um, a panel this afternoon in uh, one of the cracks. At 2.45, uh, the other room, we have a panel debate and uh, hoping for many more questions. Yeah, yeah. So in the meantime, Ron Toledo, thank you very much.